So there's a, a question here, first of all, um, do you see any benefits for the aggregates industry in teaming up with the burgeoning metals industry in the UK to give us a bigger voice to government about the importance of all aspects of subsurface natural capital? David, that's a nice big question for you to start with. Yes, and the, the, the strategy um, isn't exclusively about aggregates. It does cover um, all minerals, um, but focuses on the non-energy side. So definitely, um, I think the principles in it apply to all mineral sectors. Um, I focused in the presentation on aggregates because the biggest tonnage and so the widest use and the biggest in influence um, by land use planning. Um, but no, definitely. Um, and the CBR Minerals Group is a wider church anyway, and it draws in other sectors. So um, yeah, and please do feel free to you know, use it and come back to us on um, how you think you know, we, we could use it ourselves to promote your cause. Okay, um, so the, the next question that's uh, there is, do you think imports will fill much of the gap? Not for aggregates, no. Um, it, most, the vast majority, 90 odd percent is indigenous material, as you probably know. Um, so no, I think the difference is um, the, particularly in areas like the southeast and London is increasing proportion of marine dredged um, and also imports of rock from the Midlands and the southwest replacing uh, land one aggregates in the southeast so I think um, I can see a growing role for marine dredged um, but I don't think uh, imports from overseas given the, the low value and high bulk of the, and the cost of transportation is going to be a significant factor in the future plus we are well endowed with resources um, it's just making sure we get access to them isn't it yes exactly I would, I would just add to that that uh, BGS did do a, a study looking at uh, the feasibility of importing aggregates and we don't have enough port space in this country we don't have the infrastructure to move it from the ports to the many different sites that it needs to go to so yeah, in, in terms of aggregates, it's really not that not that feasible. Um, we have a, a question saying, can we share the presentation slides? Um, well, the whole recording is going to be on the EIG YouTube channel. Um, I don't know, David, are you happy to, to send of the slides? Around? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be putting them on um, the MPA's website as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we have a, I'm not sure this is a, Oh, we have a question here. Um, the MPA recently published a paper on reform of the mineral planning system. Are you able to give some background to this and explain the current status? Yes, so um, government issued a discussion document called Planning for the Future, um, which was a precursor to the forthcoming planning white paper. So part of planning reform. Um, that included lots of identified lots of issues with the planning system um it was very focused entirely on housing delivery not surprisingly because that's where the attention is um but some of the issues with planning in terms of slow plan making to adoption out of date plans the amount of information required to develop plans and slowing it down um they were the same issues that affect mineral planning um but the sole focus on housing as usual. So we took an opportunity to produce a very simple briefing, drawing together messages that, that come from the mineral strategy itself, um, but also that we submitted as part of the cutting red tape review, which was started about three or four years ago by government and then dropped. Um, so we drew those together into six, um, identified as six, uh, six issues and six actions which government could take. Again, the principal role of that is to say it's not all about housing. If you want to deliver housing and infrastructure and commercial development and the economy, you're going to need material supply and you can't assume supply. So you've got to plan for it. So the, the first aim was to raise the profile of minerals yet again because it was ignored. Um, the second was to draw some parallels with planning for housing and planning for minerals and then put in some additional points specifically about minerals planning, which again, reflect what's in the strategy. So the need for better coordination at national level and forecasting, so, and statements of need. So for aggregates um, going into construction, that would be the, the guidelines, the aggregates guidelines, which set out the national 15 year 
uh, forecast of demand, which then could get fed through to the aggregates working parties and planning authorities. At the moment, as I said in the presentation, there's a vacuum in terms of overall national need. Um, local aggregate assessments are being produced, um, which tend to be backwards looking. They do try to project forward, but it's impossible to do that at local level. So we need, we need some benchmarks in terms of what's the national level of demand we're going to be looking at and how's that going to be met locally. So the guidelines and forecasting was one of the, one of the um, things we put in that paper. Um, improving resourcing and skills within mineral, mineral planning authorities um, and suggesting that actually pooling of resources across authorities, which is already happening in a number of areas with joint plans or with planning authorities um, acting as consultancies for other authorities. But it's a pooling of the necessary skills to do the job and that's been diluted over the last 15 years. Um, and also duplication of planning and permitting, which is causing an issue for MPA members and CBI Minerals Group members. Um, they, they get the planning permission, they submit um, enormous amounts of evidence, which is necessary to get through that, including in, um, EIAs. Um, then it comes to the permitting and they're finding they have to submit similar evidence, but in a different format, potentially, you know, in a different, to different specification, which again, puts a risk on implementation of the planning permission, which should be, um, the primary uh, license to operate. So we put all those, we took this opportunity to put those in, um, hoping that that would then feed through into DCLG, MHCLG and the planning white paper. Um, there is wider reform underway too in planning. Um, you may have picked up last weekend in the press, I think, um, radical suggestions about reform to the planning system. And it, a lot of that's coming from think tanks like the Policy Exchange. And apparently Generic has uh, coordinated a, a working group of experts to look at radical means of reforming planning. The headlines that came out were around zoning and permitted development rights, um, which may not affect minerals planning, but you know, they are thinking as they do periodically um, for pretty dramatic reforms to get, as they see it, and the planning system to work better. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we did there. Um, as I say, it was, it was really taking the opportunity to, and, and the, the dismay really again that it was all about housing and to deliver the housing you need everything else um so yeah that, that's the background to it okay thank you that's good uh so the next question uh is asking if you can clarify the projection for mean aggregate marine aggregate supply to 2030 and how confident is the NPA of this projection i assume that means clarify how you how you came up with that projection i think the graphs yeah um all I've shown there is one of a series of scenarios. Um, so the MPA's um, economics team have been producing these for a few years now. Um, again, this was a response to the absence of any guidelines and any forward forecasting by government. So a couple of years ago, we, with our members, with the MPA members, um, looked at what the potential um, demand is gonna be based on um, population forecasts, economic forecasts, construction output forecasts from national um, sources to look at a, a kind of projection forward of where what potential um, demand would be over 15 years. Then we liaise with our members um, to discuss what would be potential mixes of supply to meet that demand, looking at the main, you know, the main um, sources, so rock, Sand, land one sand and gravel, marine dredged and recycled material. Um, so that we came up with a series of scenarios there, which look at, you know, will, will land one sand and gravel be increasingly replaced by marine dredged and crushed rock, for example, which is what the graph I showed was. But there's also other scenarios, which are, you know, the mix stays the same. Um, so it's really just trying to inform, to try and get a picture ourselves within the industry of what the future might look like and how we might meet it and then of course drill down are there going to be what are the um, opportunities and constraints to delivering that kind of mix now i think things have moved on now we've got somebody in mhclg um well the director kind of understands why managed aggregate supply system is important what it is um <clears throat> we're losing the managed bit because the guidelines are, are defunct now um so we're saying well actually we need those and, and how about using these scenarios as a you know a starting point um, which is coming from an industry perspective on where we might need to get to. And these, you know, we're trying to help CLG and inform their production of new guidelines. So yeah, Oralee, who's our chief economist, would make me say they're not um, forecasts. 
they're very much scenarios and there are a number of them it's just for brevity i can only you know it's a whole new presentation but i can only put one of those in so it's just a scenario of, but you know what and i'll put that one in because that one shows um increasing replacement of land one not not complete replacement you know there's still a significant contribution from land one but it's um replacement of land one by marine dredged and crushed rock um, reflecting recent trends which i showed in the previous you know previous graph where that's already happening is that going to continue that scenario shows if it continues this is these are the tonnages you might end up with in 15 years Okay, um, so th th we now have a, the next question is a slightly uh, different angle. Um, what are your views on the impact of the red diesel tax on UK construction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not my area, but I know about it um, affecting um, the machinery on site. Um, I mean, the MPA's view was if, if farmers, if the agricultural sector is continues to be exempt, you know, there needs to be a level playing field between the agriculture and, and the minerals side, and we're getting hammered by it. Um, that's all I, I'll say on that. Mm. Yeah, significant impact in terms of expenditure on fuel on sites, yes. which doesn't apply across the wider economy for some reason, because farmers are always protected. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we'll move on swiftly from that. Um, how do you know, oh, sorry, hi, do you know why companies are failing to bring forward enough applications? Yeah, it's a, we've asked them. Um, <laughs> it's a mix of things i think i think it's until recently it was still a fallout from the 2008 2009 um recession and retrenchment um reorganization mergers loss of staff loss of long-term or ability to do long-term planning um particularly in the, in the larger companies i think that was a factor um we also even despite you know 90 between 90 and 100 percent of planning applications being permitted um there's still a risk involved if you don't have site allocations um, or you don't have very supportive policies or an up-to-date plan so again the risk in and it's very expensive as you know to put together a planning application with all the necessary supporting evidence um so it's a risky venture um so i think there was a, a tendency to sweat assets um rather than invest in new in new reserves i think that's the situation is going to be picking up or was going to be picking up until the, the latest not back um but i think there's a whole range of reasons um, and depends on the size of the company um the management of the company and its priorities but i think you know those are probably the key reasons it's difficult to get clear advice from the, the companies themselves on that yeah yeah uh Okay, so the next question is, are you seeing an increased interest in national resource security or domestic production after all the supply di disruption from the, the COVID pandemic? Uh, well, I don't think, as we, it goes back to the previous question, I think about indigenous supply, you know, for, for aggregates especially, um, the supply is indigenous. For, the other, for other materials, I understand for, in terms of our export of, um, some of the clays, for example, down in Cornwall, the market's still very healthy. Um, they, they, they weren't too badly affected by um, the lockdown and, my, and the demand uh, was pretty uh, consistent. Um, in terms of overall a government approach to this, I don't think we've seen an effect yet. Um, and I don't think necessarily it's gonna be an issue in terms of, I mean, our, our, you know, we're, we supply the, uh, the construction market particularly in terms of aggregates and so it's it's affected by um construction output construction activity um so i don't think we've seen the, the any anything from that at all yet yeah it, it might be a little bit too early i know um bgs has provided different government departments with a few briefing papers that they that they asked for um related yeah. to the disruption but um yeah we'll, we'll see so there is there is one question in the chat if um which i am going to read out now but i just reiterate um that everybody should use the q a button please it's quite difficult to look at look at the things so the question is um is there an eig vision paper for the low carbon future of the aggregate industry given uk zero carbon tar targets for 2050 or before i'm sure it needs to be an eig vision paper but does the uh, cbi and minerals group have a vision paper for the low carbon future no, not yet. 
that we're working on it. Um, I think the concrete sector especially have made um, a lot of progress on that. Um, we are very conscious that um, net zero, I'm speaking to MHCLG, climate change and carbon reduction is going to be a big feature of future policy for planning. Um, I mentioned uh, the, end, the National Planning Policy Framework in the uh, presentation. Um, we understand that that's likely to be, that it was only reviewed two years ago, but it's likely to be up for substantial review again and net zero and climate change is going to feature heavily within that. Um, so that's got potential impacts um, at site level um, in terms of allocation of sites and planning permission for sites, which we're going to have to start addressing. Um, as I say, the main, in terms of emissions though, um, cement and concrete is the big, the big one. Um, so UK concrete part of MPA has produced a vision recently um, on reducing carbon. Um, I think we need to, well, in fact, we are over the summer thinking more, more in depth about what we need to be saying in terms of um, other extraction and how we respond to that at site level or national level. So we've got to, yeah, we've got to address this and we've got to advise members um, how to navigate around, particularly the planning system with, with planning authorities, local authorities adopting climate emergency declarations and producing strategies, which will at some point impact on their local plans, um, whether they get through examinations or the matter, but I think politically at the local level, it's going to be a big driver. So we, you know, we've got to address it. So the, the next question says, uh, will HS2 increase the ability to move more aggregates by rail? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Um, one issue with HS2, though, is um, lack of clarity until very recently about the demand it will, it will place on supplies and assumptions around the supplies um, and the new additional reserves which are going to be required to provide for it and other major infrastructure. Um, so that's our main, that's been our main focus um, on that rather than, rather than its use for, for transporting freight, because I don't, I don't know enough about that. Um, on yeah, the general my, my point. Sorry, David, my, my understanding is the only impact it could have was if some of the, um, pedet some of the carrying of people shifted to HS2 off of the main, well, it might create more, more train paths on mm. the regular lines, but um, I don't know, really. No. And on that point, you know, we've, we've made the point to various audiences um, around the, the, the difficulty of getting good information um, about the, the demands that major infrastructure projects are going to place on supply. Now, that, partly that's because some of those projects are inherently uncertain anyway until they they start um but it's just a, including major housing developments you know it's it's it, local authorities producing local aggregate assessments quite often have a list of major infrastructure in their area um but there's no indication of what the sort of demands those are going to place on supply and so there's a need for better more transparency over that obviously it depends on the supply is going to depend on all sorts of factors commercial factors um, but some citing on particularly the major national infrastructure projects in terms of overall demand and how we feature that into, I think that's why we need the guidelines, to be honest. That's the place to, to put major national infrastructure demands into what the overall needs are going to be, break it down regionally. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, the next question uh, is about secondary and recycled aggregates. What are the opportunities for recycled and secondary aggregates? Can they provide a greater input to the overall strategy? And should this be included in the forward planning? What are the limitations to their use? Several questions in one there, David. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so recycled and secondaries make up about 30% of the market. I think um, the MPA is just producing some new data on this, which yes, suggests it's around 28% of the, of the market. Um, we think that that's pretty much plateauing now. It has been plateauing recently. Um, obviously, you can only, the supply is the construction demolition waste and only a fraction of that, a hard fraction, um, which then, then some of that um, is available for use as recycled and um, material for construction, including some, you know, lower, lower specification concretes. Um, but we think that 30% is probably, we're probably maxed out now. Um, probably the best in Europe, 
probably maxed out in terms of the p percentage of overall supply. Um, the scenarios I showed you assume that it stays at around 30%. Um, one issue we've come across, and the, the, the National Planning Policy Framework says the advice on minerals planning is, first of all, you consider availability and potential, I think practical, how practicable it is to supply needs from recycled and secondary materials, then you consider the primary materials. Um, but I think we do that anyway, because the market generally does that anyway. Um, companies and kit, the kit's so much, so much better these days in terms of the separation of the, the, the materials into what's, what's usable for um, suitable purposes. Um, so I think we're at that level. The MBBF says you should prioritise it. We've come across local plans where um, objectors use that to say, well, actually, you don't need any primary materials. You don't need to allocate sites uh, for extraction because you should be increasing recycling. But that's, that doesn't reflect the quality of the material, the amount of material that's coming through from construction activity. Um, and then the ability to use it in different applications. So it's generally not suitable for structural concrete. Um, so that's a major part of the market. So all of those factors mean that probably around the 30% mark is, is pretty much maximum, um, which is what we're assuming. As I say, MPA is just producing some new information, um, looking at construction activity and generation of construction demolition waste, what's likely to be available and how much is that going to be used, how that can feed through into the market. But as you know, also raw data on construction waste generation is very, very poor, always has been. It's poor nationally, it's really poor locally. Um, so a lot of this is based on assumptions. But you know, from seeing what, how the market operates um, and the majority of material, the vast majority of material going into productive use already, there's not a lot of waste out there that is going to disposal in landfill. Some of it may be going to positive use in terms of restoration, but a lot of it, most of it, goes to productive use. Yeah, it, it is an area that I think would, would probably benefit from, from more research. Um, and I, you know, I, I know some of the universities are thinking about that. Um, okay, so the next question is about biodiversity net gain. Um, so how will the biodiversity net gain affect schemes where a planned but not delivered restoration is impacted by a subsequent proposed scheme? Will the assessment be done on current or will Will it be on the planned versus proposed? For example, where a quarry is deepened and the scheme goes from shallow high value biodiversity to low value deep water? As I understand it, it's, it's the baseline is at the point of the application. So if you're applying to, if the, if the proposal is to, that in that example, um, on site reduce the biodiversity, the applicant would have to find um, a means of delivering the 10% uplift. Now that may be through management, if you're at a minerals company and you have um, an estate and assets, land assets, uh, there's potential for doing it on your own land, but you would have to deliver, you still have to deliver a 10% increase in biodiversity value from, from the application site to the site afterwards. Um, so that, my understanding is the baseline is at the point of application is I think the answer there. So. Again, I think the industry is more fortunate than um, others that we, there's only a small, relatively small number of applications per year for new sites or extensions. Uh, they can be very large, obviously, but they're a small number, whereas housing's tens of thousands of applications and they have no history of delivering net gain. Um, what most, most housing developers are going to have to pay basically a tariff, which goes into a pooled fund, which pays for... Um, offsetting and net gain elsewhere. Now the option is there for minerals companies to do that, but I think that there'll be more options, more cost-effective options for doing it on your own land or on another site elsewhere. Okay, so there's another question related to uh, biodiversity net gain here. It says, could you foresee local planning authorities potentially prioritizing the permitting of sites within their patch on the basis of their proposed biodiversity gain? Yeah. So this is talking about minerals sites, I think. So a strategy for um, identifying areas for mineral extraction, obviously that needs to reflect the geology. But um, yes, I can see um, where, and it's sensible planning, isn't it? To look at where the multiple gains might be delivered through, through that land use. Um, so they may, another thing that's coming through, which we haven't mentioned yet, is the Environment Bill 
Um, I mentioned net gain coming through that, but also um, nature recovery strategies um, is a feature of that. Um, where local authorities are supposed to be identifying in their plans um, areas for nature recovery. So it's not just about protecting what's there now, it's about recovery, which is net gain. Now those spatial identification of where the opportunities are should um, tie in with where you're allocating sites for minerals extraction, I'd imagine, because that's the sensible way to, to do it. Now minerals extraction, as participants will know, um, it's only a small um, land area involved, but what differs between other types of development is obviously you've, it's a temporary land use and you can have progressive restoration. You can have enhancement prior to development, um, even on rock, you know, screening buns, which are then managed um, for wildlife rather than just planted up. Um, but you have progressive restoration and then at the final restoration, you can have a very, very large scale biodiversity net gain, well in ex exceedance of 10%, you know, hundreds of percent. Um, even on some rock sites, um, old rock sites, with a retrospective application of the metric, 10% um, gain is coming out as not, you know, not difficult to achieve. Um, so yeah, I think it makes sense to, it, I can foresee, going back to the question, um, planning authorities looking at opportunities for nature recovery and minerals being part of that. Um, okay, so the next question says, uh, is there a need for investment in new programs for resource assessment to support work on local plans and identifying areas for potential resources? Sorry, so, so again? Is, is there a need think? for investment in new programs for resource assessment uh, in order to support local plans and identify areas of potential resources? Um, uh. <laughs> You may answer that. It depends, I suppose, on the, the level of detail that they're meaning by that question. I mean, uh, BGS already has um, mineral resource maps covering all of England and Wales and a good part of Scotland, which identify areas of known resources, not just potential resources. Um, we don't um, investigate them in, in a great level of detail. We tend to leave that to industry. But uh, I think as a country, we pretty much know where our resources are. Um, and yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave that one there and go on to the next question, which is um, again returning to secondary and recycled um, material. Last year, NPA published analysis of recycling the slope of the economy at success in aggregate mineral industry in relation to waste resource. Would this impact the virgin mineral demand and need for mineral planning? I think I probably answered that at the previous time, I think. I think. Yeah, I think so, mostly. I think, I'm not quite sure. Well, what we, what we, produced, yeah. we produced a couple of documents um, that the MPA did showing the um, our assumptions and data used to come up with the 28%. We also sh produced a document showing the flow of construction, demolition and excavation waste um, from its generation to where it goes for positive use down to disposal. And it, it revealed, not surprisingly, that a very, very small percentage and tonnage goes to disposal. And even that is probably restoration of landfills as well. Um, although it's classed as disposal in waste management terms. Um, so I think that's probably what this is referring to. Um, but I think that backs up what I've, what I've said, is there isn't a vast amount of material out there which is going to waste or unproductive use. Um, yeah, so, so it's never going to get to 100% of replacing virgin mineral demand. It wouldn't anyway because of um, obviously specifications, um, but also that, you know, the material, you're dependent on construction activity and demolition um, to bring the material through to be recycled, to potentially be used. Um, so, you know, we've, our assumptions map, map match uh, construction activity um, in terms of the amount of material that's, that's available. But yeah, that flow chart we produced, which is really striking, just shows where the material goes, um, which includes, um, it includes it, we produced that because of statements by government about the amount of waste there was, the amount of construction waste, but actually that's just a, that's a bit misleading to give an overall figure when, when the vast majority goes off to productive use in the economy elsewhere. I think the simple answer is there's always going to be a need for mineral planning. <laughs> yeah, no, there'll still be a need for well, mineral planning. There'll still be a need for primary extraction and 
within this country. Yeah. Yeah. Clive, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, just one more question, and I think we'll we'll wrap then. Okay. Um, all right. So the um, the the last question then is going to be any funded research on utilization of worked out deep hard rock quarries often these have limited biodiversity but possible potential energy storage not that i'm aware of that we're doing through mpa at all or cbr minerals group but i think if you were a company with an asset like that you would be looking at potential options yeah okay so i think we are thereabouts out of time uh, there's a couple of questions that we didn't get to unfortunately but uh, sorry about that um it's been quite quite amazing to have so many uh, so many of your questions and uh, i hope that everybody has uh, has enjoyed this this first webinar and uh, i certainly think it's been a very uh, interesting process and a good process and we'll uh, hopefully have some more of these in the, in the coming months <laughs>